Boosh, boosh. Listen to Abe Thompson for an hour. I'd rather fuck a blood relative. What is up, guys? How is it going? This is a Thompson and other disappointments, and it's the goddamn solo show. If it's your first time listening, uh, tuning in, welcome, welcome to this veritable festival of downers. This celebration of all things politics, dystopia, and all-round awfulness. Uh, where we try to give you that uh, that gallows humour, that misery loves company, empathetic catharsis feeling, you know. So so then you feel good, right? But then we bombard you with depressive nonsense until you kind of you know you collapse into hysterics, and then a few hours later you just remember feeling you know good ish kind of, but you also remember being in hysterics, and and so then you kind of confuse it with having had a, a good time. That is the sweet spot. That's the magic trick that we perform on this podcast. Take a seat, crack open a beer, pour yourself a G&T, whatever. You've earned it. Let's fucking do this. Let me take you on a dance through the doom lolsery of my dystopian demeanor. I am feeling the alliteration today, guys. Honestly, yes, you could be listening to the troll or the rest is politics. Yes, they're smarter <laughs> and better prepared for their shows and way more up on the detail. But let me ask you this. Can Alistair Campbell or Rory Stewart weave a sentence together where 90 percent of the words needlessly start with the same letter? Can they? Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> this is the premium shit. This is booge. Anyway, uh, quick what's up to the uh, the Patreon backers. Um, your support, as always, much appreciated. I'm looking forward to the live show on Friday the 10th of February. It's not far to go now. Uh, it should be fun. Uh, it goes without saying, if you do want to get involved in the live stuff, and there's a March meetup also in, uh, in London, if you want to get involved in all that stuff and join the Discord chat, I jump on there every day. Uh, and join my cult and get episodes like this two days before everyone else on Spotify and Apple, etc. Uh, then don't be a stranger. Do jump on to patreon.com forward slash aid Thompson with an I N on the end. That's patreon.com forward slash aid Thompson. Or you can hit my site, uh, which is funk 27.co.uk. That's got all of the old episodes of the podcast on there and blogs and loads of other shit. Uh, it's funk 27 .co.uk forward slash Patreon. So you can get to Patreon through my site also. Uh, right. What is going on, guys? What's happening out there? Binfluencer fans. People of the booge. Uh, the collapse of the United Kingdom is happening right in front of our very eyes. Ambulance response times are the worst on record. Operation waiting times are the worst they have ever been. Trains are fucked. The post is fucked. Like, if you have a serious medical issue right now, those delays could all add up. Like, on top of one another. It could, you know, feasibly take, what, like, 14 hours waiting for the ambulance? And then what, like two hours sitting in the hospital car park waiting to be dispatched from the ambulance? And then once you are finally dispatched like into the hospital, then maybe 20 hours in the A&E? Maybe you die before you get to a fucking bed. And maybe your relatives can't visit because the trains aren't happening. So instead, what do they do? They, they send a condolence card in the Royal Mail, which arrives six weeks late, right? <laughs> All of this shit could add up. And yet, that condolence card might actually weirdly kind of be on time. <laughs> because because the mortuaries are all full and the embalmers and like all of that shit drags on. So then the funeral is only just happening after six weeks. Like that, feasibly, that could be the run of events. Could it not? That is Brexit Britain, ladies and gents. A magical place of sunlit uplands 
and way expired cadavers. You know, just stinking out the fucking church through a wooden box. Sales of incense sticks shooting up because every church vicar is like, oh, God, yes, yes, we do funerals. Fuck me. Carol, Carol, we got another one. Yeah, it's another funeral. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Look, how long has this one been delayed for at the hospital? And, and it, um, it's, it was about six weeks. Right, right, six weeks. Carol, we, yeah, look, we're going to need some more scented candles. Yeah, it's like the, the core components of society are collapsing around us, are they not? Transport, infrastructure, healthcare. But it's fine. Like, you know, nobody's paying much attention to it. The newspapers don't seem to be frothing about it. And our leaders are doing what exactly are they like? Like in Whitehall and in the Conservative Party, we have what, like Prime Minister Rishi Sunak giving his first TV address the other night. So there's that. Like. <laughs> We're not obsessing or tearing our hair out over the collapsing state of the United Kingdom. We are, we've got Prime Minister Sunak giving his first broadcast and first address and like, and despite, you know, the sycophantic blather that was fire hydranted out of the CCHQ WhatsApps that obviously went out immediately afterwards. Like I found the address, his first TV address. I found it to be, um, well, look, I mean, look, half, half of me was sort of happy for Rishi Sunak, right? I'm happy for anyone when it is clear that they got the DSLR that they wanted for Christmas. <laughs> like, I'm excited for anyone when they decide that they want to make, start making online content, which is quite obviously what has happened here. <laughs> like, like what, three weeks ago, somebody would have been like, what, what's your New Year's resolution, Rishi? And he's like, oh, you'll see, you know, while he's stroking or like polishing his Nikon 3560 with a $5,000 lens and shit like. This week, Prime Ministerial Address. Next week, makeup tutorials. It makes fucking perfect sense as well, because like all, all of that visiting Silicon Valley and getting the green card, you know, surrounded by beautiful American teenagers in the lobby of YouTube or Google and shit, probably, when he was out there. Like, then he comes back, asks Santa for a DSLR, makes a video, uploads his shit videos with his poor lighting to Twitter. Good for you, Rishi! Good for you! I get it. You went to Winchester and Oxford, but you have never been more relatable to me. <laughs> But real talk, you know what I got for Christmas, Prime Minister? I got doubled mortgage payments, but I'm happy for you and your new toy. But anyway, yeah, half of my brain was saying all of that shit. You know, I'm happy for him. He's obviously doing <laughs> what he wants to with Brad Rishi and his slick videos. And shit. But anyway, the other half of me was like, God, this motherfucker has the charisma of half a badger smeared on a curb. Like, he really fucking does. Like, he's just not someone who could ever engage a group of people. You know? There are some people out there who effortlessly capture, you know, and engage people. You know, this is not a person who will capture anyone's imagination. He has no gravitas, no charisma. He's just this sort of auto cued insincere, deep fake looking pretender sat at his dad's desk on work experience at the local Savills. Like that is the th that, that's what I get from him. I get work experience energy from him. You know what I mean? That's his vibe. Like if the feel that they were going for with his, you know, his presentational style with the video. If the vibe that the director was going for was like, yeah, I want you to um, pretend that you are an AI representation of a sociopath. You know, like if that was what the direction was before they started writing, yes, great. You fucking nailed it. <laughs> you are a natural. 
Like what? Yeah, uh, uh, and cut. And and then once again, once again with feeling. Pri- oh, wait, uh, did I did I say with feeling? I meant zero feeling. Just be monotonous. Just be a bit nervous and a bit beige. Like if that was the director's direction, then Rishi Sunak is a fabulous performer. But that is if. That was the director's direction. I I think huge likelihood probably it was not. Cheers, by the way. I mean, I imagine the direction was probably more like, oh God, oh please, oh, please, one more try. Could we just take this take this from the top again? And and this time, just try to sound like you're a human yeah like <laughs> how, how do you mean well i mean you know you're talking to the public here yeah well yeah but come on i mean cut cut me some slack how do you mean well you know i don't do public anything you know public transport public health care talking to the public i mean you, you saw the soup kitchen thing right because he doesn't do public does he he doesn't do public he's so out of touch and weird and sat there behind his refurbished 19th century desk or whatever but in his gucci platforms and you know armani suit and then then he's like i know we're all feeling the pinch like it's not even that they're detached like they're obviously detached when they come on these first addresses and you know give speeches and stuff like it's obvious they live in another world but it's a stupidity that goes with it that is mind-boggling isn't it like does nobody pull them aside and go do you understand how ridiculous you sound with your cut glass accent and your three thousand dollar socks made out of human hair or some shit like trying to sound like you understand what it's like for the seven million people on the fucking breadline do you do you get why that's ridiculous <laughs> there's no one there that can say that to him i know we're all feeling the pinch meanwhile you know sound of don perignon corks popping in the background <laughs> like it's a financially delicate time for us all like with, with all the empathy and sympathy of a hot friend pretending to understand how you feel getting sexually rejected five times in a row in all bar one you know like how could they have any understanding of your situation so why are they pretending you know like one of the i don't know if you've ever had one of those friends maybe you're a beautiful person you've never had to worry about this but it is infuriating when when you're in a bar and you're like man None of these women fancy me. I am fucking hideous. Like, what is the what? What is wrong with me? You know. And then your mate is like, Yeah, yeah. No, I know. I know what you mean, man. You know, just this handsome motherfucker with dimples and a perfect jawline. <laughs> and then he has the gall to go, Yeah. I mean, like, it's oh, it is annoying when women aren't interested. And you're like, you know, you're like, Dan. There is literally a woman sucking you off under the table right now. You know, <laughs> like, like the only time they don't go home with you is when they're both too injured from fighting each other over who gets to go home with you, Dan, you pretty cunt. It's just like that with Rishi, right? It's like, Rishi, I'm so broke. My kids are literally eating grass from the lawn. I can't even boil it for them because the electric's too much. It's just a fucking Paw Patrol bowl of stinging nettles and then dock leaves for dessert as a little treat to take some of the stinging away. I'm fucking broke, Rishi. Yes, yes, I know how you feel. I mean, it is it is a tough time for all of us. I mean, like, it really is. It's, it's the not all men and the all lives matter of British poverty, isn't it? It's like... It's like, hey, this is a bad thing that's happening to a specific group of people. And then the response is, hey, I I don't want to have to deal with the responsibility or the specifics of what you're saying. So I'm just going to broaden this shit the fuck out. (laughs) It's like, oh, we're all we're all going through a hard time, though. All, All lives matter. You know, not all men. Anyway, so Sunak did his first TV broadcast thing. Right. And it was billed as Sunak's first address. And I thought that was quite telling. It always is, you know, how people 
bill things. The phraseology, if that's the right word. Because it sort of suggests how they want you to think of them, right? It is his first address. His... Actually, how did he say it on Twitter? Maybe I've got that. Got it in my notes somewhere. Here we go. I am actually. I do do some preparation for these. You will be shocked to hear. I just work very hard to make it look this disorganized. Right. So he said, watch my first broadcast to the nation as prime minister. <laughs> right. Watch my first broadcast to the nation as prime minister. Well, fucking Wow. Big things, Rishi. Big things. You know, it just kind of tells you that he wants you to see him or this as a televised address to his people kind of thing. I think, you know, like he is our leader and we should be salivating at what he has been good enough to gather us all here to listen to what he's about to say. You know, that, that sort of thing. That's the read that I get. It is his broadcast to you as prime minister. Like if that was me or, you know, or probably you, like, wouldn't we just, be, we'd be like, tomorrow night I'm making a pre-recorded statement which will be shown on BBC One at 6 p.m. or whatever, you know, but, but this, watch my first broadcast to the nation as your prime minister it just you know it just gives off some kim jong energy right like wordplay not intended right but it's a it's a bit roman emperor ish isn't it it's a little bit the president is announcing we are going to war it's it's like that sort of it's a serious address from me to my people anyway it was shown on uh, bbc and itv on the Wednesday night. Uh, so whether you're a Coronation Street or an ambulance fan, they've got you covered. Which I loved, by the way. It's no fucking wonder that he made zero mention of the strikes <laughs> in his first address. Because because they showed it on BBC early evening, right? And then almost straight after it is ambulance right which is this fly on a wall documentary thing about the grueling gritty reality of being a paramedic in the uk right like and that would be some serious juxtaposition some serious comedic contrast there if the pm was sat there like and also i i wish to communicate to you my subservient plebs my filthy rotting poffers that i understand your struggle and i acknowledge and celebrate the commitment of our nurses and ambulance workers. Thank you and good night. And then just smash cut to ambulance. And it's, you know, two paramedics sobbing, trying to hide a corpse under the stretcher so they can pick up your granddad in the final throes of his heart attack. Just fucking hilarious contrast. I mean, it would be great. It would be great if the video editor and the continuity guys, you know, behind the scenes, if they just showed a bit of sass that night and they like, you know, cross faded footage of rishi smiling at the camera and giving a little clap for the carers you know if they cross-faded that over the paramedics crying smushing this dead face into the storage block just fucking i'm not saying it's funny i'm just saying you know as a comedian as a video editor i would i would appreciate the juxtaposition it would be almost tarantino-esque anyway so so he used his televised address thing to say a load of shit and uh you know a load of rubbish that most of us would have predicted it was a load of rubbish before his you know king's speech started he, he made a point of suggesting that he pushed ahead with the energy price cap when others didn't want to that was one thing he said which look you know that may be true in sunak's mind like in the self-satisfied, self-endorphinizing depths of his ego-y, slick video content, my first address break. Like maybe he does think he bravely implemented the energy price cap against all advice, against the wishes of the opposition, and he protected everyone, right? But that is a fantasy. Sunak did not come up with the idea. It was a labor idea. And he went ahead with it against 
the wishes of. Not the opposition, who obviously supported it, given it was their fucking policy, but against the wishes of his own party. So what exactly is this address telling us? That the Tories are cunts who didn't want to cap our energy bills. Well, fucking blinding. So someone alert the media. The Conservatives were willing to freeze poor people to protect big business. Colour me shocked. And it wasn't like he price capped it really, was it? Like he, he put a price cap in that protected people from, frankly, country ruining price hikes. And it wasn't even him, it was Ofgem. And he didn't prohibit Ofgem from raising the price cap, so fuck him. He's like, oh, oh I, I persuaded my billionaire energy mates that they could only hike the electricity bill to the absolute most they could get away with without skull-fucking the economy. Well, you should get the Nobel, clearly. You are my saviour, my fucking hero. Bonnie Tyler music should start playing in the background. Just full on saving the day, aren't you? I mean, I don't want to sound ungrateful at your, your fucking unparalleled premium tier governance and leadership here. But why are you here? There's so many other places you're needed. There's so many other, there's so many cats stuck up trees and damsels in distress. Go, go now and let others enjoy your unrivaled saviordom. Anyway, of course, over the weekend... Another former chancellor has also uh, got himself in trouble. Nadim Sahawe, who was chancellor for all of three weeks or some shit last year, wasn't he? And he's getting in a spot of bother over his tax affairs. And so he becomes the second chancellor of the last year to have got in a spot of bother over his tax affairs. So there's after, you know, Sunak, it wasn't really Sunak, but Sunak's wife and her non-dom status right is it is it possible here's a question for you is it possible to have one fucking chancellor who isn't gaming the system <laughs> that he himself is in charge of please can we can we have that is that possible to get that one question injected into what you know was at the time boris johnson's interview process i guess you know could that interview have been like do 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 you know what uh what what an economy is. Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. Do, uh, do, do you have a credit rating um, above 57? And, they'd, you know, <laughs> they'd be like, do you? <laughs> With your weird CCJs that miraculously resolved themselves as soon as they appeared in the newspapers. Do you have any CCJs or a credit rating that's problematic? <laughs> Let's move on. And then, and then would come the next set of questions, you know, be Johnson-like. Are you, um, are, are you a, a, a British citizen? And for Sunak, it sounds like that might have been a tricky one to answer, you know, because he's kind of American now, isn't he? He had the green card thing going on. There were meetings between him and his wife and Silicon Valley millionaires and shit. I, like, I, I remember for a bit, it sounded like they were just going to fuck off to California, right? Do you remember that? So I don't know. In Sunak's interview, maybe it would have been like, "Are, are you um, are you a, a, a British uh, citizen?" And he would have been like, oh, "I I could be <laughs> for the for the right role for the right package." But even that, you know, Johnson would have come unstuck because he he's fucking American. He's born in or was born in New York, I gather. Anyway, could we not have had one question in there, you know, where it's like. OK, look, Nadine, you want to be chancellor. That means you're going to set and maintain tax policy in the United Kingdom. So I'm sorry to ask this. I feel a bit silly asking you this. I'm sure you wouldn't go for the job if this if there was a yes to this. But could you just please confirm that you aren't dodging tax and that you haven't got some weird history of setting up trusts in the Channel Islands or something? I feel weird asking. But could you just confirm that, please? Could you just say, uh, no, I don't? But no, apparently, that not only do they not go out of their way to exclude people with those tax arrangements, Boris Johnson was made aware of the concerns and made him chancellor anyway. So there you go, man. Like, just as certain quarters of, of the Tory party and indeed the UK population are propelling their tadpoles into the threads of their boxes over the prospect of Johnson returning to frontline politics, 
just as that's happening, we're gifted another example of him completely overlooking a valid concern to keep one of his lawyers loyalists in a lucrative role. You know, from Patterson to Pincher to Zahawe to rallying around the Pritzker and chucking the bullying investigation in the bin and to it, like all of the I consider the matter closed nonsense. Like, is there is there anyone Boris Johnson would have actually deemed unsuitable? Do you think? Like, what do you think that person would have to have done to be deemed unsuitable for cabinet by, <laughs> by Boris Johnson? Like, what would that do to your self-worth if corruption's own Boris Johnson, advocate of the VIP fast lane, serial philanderer, supporter of sex pests, defender of illegal lobbyists, if Johnson says, yeah, um, uh, not him, though, he's that that he could be problematic. Like, what would you what would you have to be doing to be deemed unsuitable, according to Boris Johnson? I mean, you know, apart from voice your concerns over what Brexit was going to do to the country. As I recall, that that was unforgivable. That solidified your status as a parliamentary pariah, didn't it? <laughs> but you can stumble around the Carlton Club fingering junior staff. That's that's fine. You can illegally lobby on behalf of your donors. By all means, crack on. But so help me God, if you deign to question the purity and sanctity of Mother Brexit, you shall be burned, you insolent, treacherous witch! You know? Anyway... Let's not let's not go too deep into this. Uh, Zahawi was hired into the, the chancellor role. Uh, you know, this episode is not about Boris Johnson. Let's move on. Let's get back to Zahawi, back to our problematic chancellors. Zahawi was hired as chancellor. And look, good for him, by the way. You know, it was obviously the right time, right place for him. He saw an opportunity and he took it. It was just incredibly lucky. It's just out of this world fortunate that the same time Nadim Zahawi felt ready to take on the challenge as Chancellor was the same time that Boris Johnson inexplicably concluded that he was the best man for the job, right? They both, they found each other, right time, right place. And it had absolutely nothing to do with the fact that Sunak and Javid and a bunch of others had mass resigned and Johnson was clamouring around, desperately trying to find someone to accept the role that we all knew would last a matter of weeks. It was just incredibly lucky. <laughs> it, it was nothing to do with that. It wasn't desperation that saw him propelled into one of the great offices of state. It was yeah, just, dis yeah, Johnson just decided he was the best man for the job lucky what was perhaps less lucky though was the fact that when you become chancellor of the exchequer your own tax status and tax history and businesses and shit that all gets examined way more closely like with chancellor sunak right the, you remember the non-dom shit i was talking about a minute ago the green the green card stuff that i mentioned well, once Zahawi became chancellor, the same thing happened to him under a microscope. People getting interested in his affairs and like, anyway, so he steps up and lo and behold, as a former founder of YouGov, right, the polling institution, he had something like a 40% share in YouGov. But whereas if you or I had 40% shares in a company and then if we sold them all, like journalists are saying Nadim did in 2017, you and me, we would all have to pay capital gains tax on it, right? Well, a few of them noticed that Zahawe had transferred his shares into an offshore trust. And then I think there was this adjacent trust set up also. I seem to remember there was like one or two in the stuff that I was reading about this. And his dad was the beneficiary of that one. And anyway, even to a casual observer, it was fucking obvious what this was, right? You, you put your shares in a trust and then you make your dad the beneficiary. And then when the shares get sold by the trust, it's offshore. So you, Nadim, don't pay the capital gains on it, right? <laughs> so if it's obvious to even a casual observer, it was slap you around the face with a wet kipper obvious to lawyers and journalists, right? 
And what they found was that this would have worked out as a four million pound saving that probably should have gone to the exchequer that landed safely inside Nadim Zahawi's pocket, or at least the pocket of this mysterious trust that he claims to not be a beneficiary of, right? So how about that shit? Cool for Millie. Pretty good day for Nadim. Probably making it rain in the Clisser. And good for him. You know, I know I sound sarcastic and cynical at the best of times, but good for him. You know how many horses you could keep warm with that money? <laughs> like, this is the thing, man. Like, Nadim Zahawe, right? He was elected as an MP in 2010, and he stayed sort of below the radar for the first couple of years until I think it was the 2013 expenses scandal, or maybe it was just a short time after it, whatever. He was found to have claimed back £5,000 for the cost of heating his stables. Do you remember that shit? It was about 10 years ago. David Cameron era. And this motherfucker puts an expense claim in for their heating of his stable. Like, what kind of fucking twat do you have to be knowing that your expenses are subject to scrutiny? Knowing that journalists will pour over this stuff and then as you're going through the receipts, filling out your spreadsheet, you're like, okay, um, right, so gas, yeah, electric, water, uh, train fare. That time I went into the uh, MP surgery and then I, I did this stuff and the charity thing. Yeah, okay, I'll claim all of that. Okay, cool. And then, uh, oh, what about the stables? Should I charge taxpayers for the upkeep of my stables and haul? Yeah, fuck it. Like, how do you not think that's going to blow up? How do you think that looks? You know? Anyway, what, what I'm saying is, Good for you, making four million pounds, abusing the UK's tax loopholes. Now you can look after your own horses, right? <laughs> and I know it feels like we lost four million pounds, guys, but we've gained five thousand pounds in heating expenses. I mean, you know, sort of. It's still a net loss of 3.9999 million or whatever. But you know what? Like with Rishi Sunak's lackluster take on price caps, I don't know, like in the next year, maybe we'll break even. <laughs> like it cost, you know, five grand to keep a couple of horses warm in 2013. It's not outrageous to think those same horses might cost four million pounds to keep warm by next winter. Anyway, where was I? So Zahawi had his tax affairs examined as is the case when people become chancellor, right? And one guy who you should follow on Twitter, if you're on Twitter and if you're interested in this stuff, uh, one guy you should follow is a guy called Dan Needle. And I gather he's a lawyer, but he also writes for Tax Policy Associates. And Needle starts looking into him and he details it out in a very loyally fashion, right? He's like, look, this guy was a founder of YouGov. And he had 40% shares, except they weren't in his name. They were allocated to an offshore trust. There was another trust involved also. Zahawi's parents appear to be the beneficiaries. And Zahawi says that he's not a beneficiary of this trust, which is, well, okay. And also Zahawi has never said that he's never benefited from offshore tax arrangements. He's just said that he and his wife don't benefit from offshore tax arrangement, which is a pretty funny defense, because it's like saying, did, hey, did you murder the bitch? I'm, I'm not murdering anyone right now. Right, yeah, but w what about before? Right, well, uh, right now I am focused on not murdering anyone. You know, like completely avoiding the question. And so Needle is asking these inconvenient questions of Nadim Zahawe. He's like, look, you founded YouGov but you don't have any shares. They were put in this other place. You say you're not a beneficiary of that. So why would you put them in there? Like, is there a credible reason why those shares would exist in that offshore location other than avoiding tax? Because if there is, Nadim should clarify what that is. Or he should come clean about his role at YouGov that it was actually not as a founder or he didn't really contribute anything and that's why he doesn't have share. Or, you know, maybe there was other people involved, like maybe his parents as beneficiaries of this thing and kind of de facto shareholders, like, did that maybe they worked at YouGov and it wasn't him, but they're in, you know. He's asking all these questions and he's saying Nadim Zahawi has to 
come clean about this and just provide some clarity. And so, in response to this, Zahawi had, you know, two or three options, dear listener. He could either accept that he's been found out, pay the tax and apologise, or he could, uh, what, like, put his finger in his ears and pretend it's not happening, but then, you know, quietly settle the bill when it does come in. <laughs> That's probably what I would do. I don't know. Like, or the final one is probably the least advisable, but for reasons best known to himself, this is the one that he chose, to Barbara Streisand this shit, right? Which is to say you draw attention to yourself and exaggerate the original problem, right? With Barbara Streisand, it was, it was her mansion, if I recall correctly, she was threatening journalists for filming her house, which didn't solve the problem. It just made everyone else more interested in seeing what was so special about this fucking house. So they started seeking out pictures of it, right? I think, I think that was the story with that one. The, the Barbara Streisand effect, or the Streisand effect is what they call it, where the attempt to shut it down actually aggravates the situation. But anyway, with Nadim, similar thing. He's in the firing line for these accusations that he's avoided tax. But instead of operating quietly, he opts to pay his expensive lawyers to threaten people like Dan Needle and to try to intimidate them into taking their articles and tweets down. But quite bravely, Dan Needle refuses, which generates more publicity and more curiosity. And so then Needle makes a point of tweeting, and, and I have it here, and it's fucking great. He says, at the time, I remember this was last summer, right? He says, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Nadim Zahawe, has been sending threatening letters to people investigating his tax affairs. The letters are designed to intimidate and say they're confidential and cannot be published. One was sent to me. I am publishing it. Like, I love the fucking balls, Dan Needle. I'm here for it. Man, like, I, I love the sass. I mean, Dan Needle is a lawyer, so I'm sure he's cool, calm, and collected about this stuff. You know, like, it's, it's not a rap beef aid. It's just, it, it is just the law. You know, he's not allowed to intimidate people. We have a right to expect elected officials to exhibit above bar conduct it is public interest i was merely asserting that aid it is not a rap rap beat, but I'm, I'm sure he would adopt a dignity that eludes me in my sensationalist beery podcast existence but i just want him to know i'm here for the balls of it right <laughs> like it's like yeah you, you're chancellor and you're responsible for addressing things like tax avoidance solving tax avoidance yeah, yeah that, that, that that's right so can we just check that you aren't a fucking tax dodger, you know, as a, as a bare minimum entry level requirement? Now you listen to me, you little plebby fucker, you fucking lefty lawyer bastards. Stop looking into my tax affairs or I'll sue you into the ground. And I, and I legally prohibit you from publishing this communication. And the needle is like, oh, fucking really? How about I put this all out on Twitter and you go fuck yourself? Like, I can imagine the dean being like, no, 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 no. This, this is going to ruin me. Like, what am I going to do? I'm the chancellor. I'll have to go or I'll be unemployed. And if it was me opposite him, I would be like, come on, man, don't be so fucking melodramatic. This was only ever a three week temp job. And you, you knew that when you started. And look, I don't want to drag this out any longer than is absolutely necessary. You guys are very good for listening for the time that you do. But let's skip straight to the happy ending. For want of a better phrase. Uh, Nadim Zahawi is on the hook with the HMRC for literally millions of pounds. And it is fucking glorious. It is chef's kiss. It is mwah. It's like, you know, this whole don't look into my tax affairs. This whole paying your expensive lawyers to send out threatening and intimidating letters for no crime other than seeking to, I don't know, what, get politicians to adhere to their own rules and sit within the realm of public interest and allow us to have some confidence and trust in the people that lead us that they might do the right thing. That's all people were trying to do was see if he was up to no good. And his response was to try to shut that shit down. And it's completely backfired on him. And now he'll have to, what, fucking liquidate his horses in his mansion or whatever. Good. Good. Fuck him. Anyway, that is a nice, uplifting note to leave you on. Thank you so much for continuing to listen to my rants and uh, shit talkery. If you are enjoying the podcast, don't be a stranger. Please do jump on patreon.com 
forward slash aid Thompson with an I N on the end. Um, I think I mentioned earlier in the podcast that you get to join uh, the Discord live chat where we're all of the other patrons are in there and I pop in there once or twice a day and we share memes and talk shit about Tories. Uh, you also get first look at the live show tickets. There's one happening on Friday, the 10th of February. I'm super, super psyched about that one. It's me, Danny fucking Price, Super Tansky and a bunch of other people. Uh, it's going to be a night of stand up, but also then a panel discussion slash podcasty bit afterwards. Uh, yeah, really, really looking forward to that. Um, you also get episodes of the podcast like this two days before everyone else. So uh, so that's pretty good. Oh, and we're doing a live uh, like an, an in-person meetup that's happening uh, in early March. I can't remember the date off the top of my head, but I'll pop that out on Twitter very, very shortly. Um, so, yeah, if you're interested in all of that, um, do jump onto patreon.com forward slash aid thompson i'll be back this friday night with a guest uh, and next wednesday again with a solo show until next time take care of yourselves i'm outie